Welcome everyone, I'm Heather Arnold. For those who don't know me, local history librarian here at Cascadini Libraries. And today we're looking at how we honoured our soldiers. So it's a look at all the war memorials that were um, the, the, community, um, the communities established after the First World War. And before I start, we'll just bring your attention to three great websites about the had lots of um, war memorials on them. The first one, of course, is Monuments Australia, which is a uh, has lots of monuments all over Australia, not just war memorials, but lots of lots of different monuments. So well worth looking at. The second one, of course, is the uh, wonderful one from the Narry Warren and District. Oh my goodness me, this is not. Well, there we go. Nary Wine and District Family History Group, Case Kidinia Remembers, which is a uh, war memorial looking at a survey of monuments and memorials in the city of Casey and Shire of Kidinia. So it does uh, war memorials, any plaque, anywhere. The busy ladies at the at the Family History Group have taken a photograph of, of it. with it on Friday, so I might still be having troubles with it. So maybe check this for Um Yeah, so the... Um, the um, yeah, anyway, so they've um, actually um, photographed every memorial they could find or on a, on a roll or plaque in the city of Casey or Shire of Cadinia. That's on their wonderful website. And the other website is uh, the library's website, Casey Cadinia commemorates our war years, which is a look at um, how people in the area um, reacted to various wars. It started off as a World War One blog, but it's also now looking at other wars. So I've gone through lots of memorials and, and if I could find the names of the soldiers, I've done little biographies of them as well. So that's a good good place to start as well. So there are three great, um, great websites that you can start looking at for memorials. Um, so Australia entered World War One on August the 4th, 1914. And at the time, we had a population of 4.9 million, of which 416,000 men enlisted, which is like 38.7% of the male population aged between 18 and 44. Around 332,000 of them embarked or went overseas, of whom more than 60,000 were killed and 156,000 were wounded, gassed or taken prisoners. Of the ones that returned, it's estimated that another 38,000 died prematurely by 1933, and they can tell that by the census figures. So with statistics like that, it's highly unlikely that any family in Australia would not have had a family member, a father, a brother, a cousin involved in the war. And even of course, for the people who stayed at home, the women, the children and the older men, they've spent the four years of the First World War in fundraising, knitting for the Red Cross, joining other patriotic leagues and more and more fundraising. They also had to keep things going. They had to run the farm, run the house, keep the children fed and keep the children clothed. So it wasn't long, uh, even before the war finished, uh, communities began to organise memorials. So for instance, this is a uh, memorial, a roll of honour that the Five Mile School produced, Five Mile is crew up north. And um, this was published in the Lang Lang Guardian June 1915, and they'd already started, so this community of Five Mile had already started producing lists of their um, the men who had enlisted or their role of honour in 1915. And of course, before the war ended, other honour boards are also established. So this is the honour, the um, Yellick Role of Honour, which was unveiled in July 1924, 1918. So of course, once again, before the war ended, and this is now at the Lang Lang, um, Lang, Lang RSL. Another early memorial was the St. Patrick's Catholic School in Pakenham. They had a roll of honour, which they on honour board, which they also unveiled in, in before the war ended in April 1918. So it's interesting that they that these communities started creating uh, commemorations for their soldiers even before the war ended. And I wondered why that was. And I, I believe. Um, so there's a various, I, I sort of feel it's the fact that communities were overwhelmed with what was happening and they needed a way to quantify their losses or sacrifices. And so they started creating these honour rolls then. Or it may have been that they just thought that the war would never end. And then if it did end, there'll be no one to remember. And that's why they started creating these honour boards before the war ended. I don't know. I actually believe it was sort of a coping mechanism and it gave communities a tangible object or project to help them make sense of what had happened. So of course, some of the um, 
early memorials and the easiest to establish were avenues of honour. Because in the olden days, all you needed was a road, some trees and some manpower. And you could plant an avenue of honour. You didn't need to get a permit. You didn't need to have a, you know, environmental impact statement. You just planted an avenue of honour. And you see that in many towns, and you can tell when you go through country towns on a drive, sometimes there's a whole row of straight trees on the entrance to the town. And you think that must have been an avenue of honour. So in this area, we have a number of um, avenues of honour. The, ones at, the one at Turidan and the one in Wilson Street in uh, Berwick was established in 1918. There's an uh, avenue of honour at Cranbourne. That's a really nice one. I've uh, just said you leave, um, leave Cranbourne on the, on the Turidan side. Um, there's one at Berwick, Harkaway and Narriwarren North and they were established in 1919. And perhaps the most prominent one in this area is the Beaconsfield Avenue of Honour because it, it's, um, on, it's on the Princess Highway. So it's quite a prominent one. And that was um, established in 1929 and funded by Ada Armitage, who was a local philanthropist. And she was, of course, one of the Armitages of Como House fame. So in this case, 123 trees were planted for the Beaconsfield soldiers, even though there are only 65 name plaques. So I don't know whether they decided to... Um, put more trees just in case or whether it was more for aesthetic reasons. But most of the 65 uh, people have a connection to Beaconsfield, even though some have a connection to the Armitage family. Another lovely little avenue of honour in this area is the Berwick Grammar School Avenue of Honour. And there's nine soldiers um, who are immortalised in this avenue of honour. And they're all boys who had attended the, the um, Berwick Grammar School. And the school operated from 1882 to 1928 in the house on the corner of uh, Church Street and Brisbane Street in Berwick. So it's just a lovely little avenue. Later avenues, oh, and this one here is this, um, the Harkaway Avenue of Honour, which was planted in 1919. Uh, in 1959, this, this um, obelisk was unveiled with all the names on them. So... The Jimbrook Avenue of Honour was planted out in 1947. That's quite an interesting one because it was planted out by the World War II soldiers in honour of the World War I soldiers. I think that's just a lovely gesture. It's just so beautiful. And interestingly enough, there were two schools that planted out, not avenues of honour, but groves of trees as memorials. So in uh, July 1917, uh, the school at Tainong planted out this Tainong grove of trees. So you can see in this photograph here, these trees here, which is the old Tainong school site, which I presume are part of the grove of trees, planted out to honour local soldiers in 1917. And at the same time, also in July 1917, uh, trees were planted at the Cadinia State School in honour of the boys of this district who responded nobly to the country's call. So that's really lovely. But perhaps, of course, the most famous avenue of honour in, in Victoria, the most well-known, is, of course, the one at Ballarat, which was um, planted out between June 1917 and August 1919. And there's 3,771 trees. It's just a beautiful avenue of honour. And also this grand arch of victory, which was unveiled by the Prince of Wales, on the 3rd of June in 1920. So they're just some examples of um, avenues of honour. And other memorials that we see are, of course, these sort of physical memorials like this one here at Narry Warren. I love this one. Uh, this was unveiled on March 12, 1922. It was on the corner of Narry North Road and the Princess Highway. It was, it was on the sort of the entrance to the recreation reserve. And the arch was uh, removed around 1950 due to safety reasons. But the two uh, pillars uh, were um, transported, to, transplanted to near the Civic Centre at um, Narry Warren and that, they're now in the forecourt at Bunjil Place. So it's still there, but not in the original location. And of course, this is the one at Coral Inn, unveiled in 1922. That's also being moved. It was the other side of the road um, near the hall. And now it's been moved to between the two drains and the drain bank, unveiled 1922. This one here at Bunyip, a, a, bit, a different sort of style, unveiled in um, 1921. And uh, 
this one here, Cranbourne. So Cranbourne, they had endless talks about what sort of memorial, what sort of form a memorial would take. Would, it, would they have a hall? Would they do this? And they finally unveiled their memorial, ironically, June 1939, just two months before the Second World War started. And this was just outside the Shire offices on the corner. Then it was hit by a car in the 1950s and moved further around um, down Sladen Street and has been moved again to... Um, Greg, Greg Clydesdale Square, which is in High Street near the shopping centre. But other, other towns had more glamorous, I would say, uh, war memorials. This is the one at Kew, and they had a budget of three and a half thousand pounds, a huge amount of money in those times, and they produced this wonderful war memorial. And this is the one I love at Hamilton, uh, Valley, 1926. That's a beautiful one. But I have to say my favourite, my favourite memorial is this one, the um, the soldier with the bowed head. I just think that's a, it's just so sweet. So this is one at Stall. There's also one at Trafalgar, exactly the same, and many other country towns you'll see this if you go for a drive. But this is such a lovely memorial. I sort of have a feeling that this soldier was based on a local soldier uh, from Cockatoo or Emerald, but I couldn't actually find the information this morning. But anyway... So if you've done any research, of course, on war memorials, one of the things that's interesting is the, uh, is the criteria that was used to select the names. And sometimes there appears to be no pattern whatsoever. So, you know, if we could go back 100 years, it'd be interesting to know what the community was thinking, but we can't do that. So the Bunyip War Memorial, for instance, has 36 names on it, even though there's at least, I've at least identified 78 people from the area who enlisted and yet they've only chosen 36 people to be in the memorial, of which um, two soldiers survived and the rest have all died. So even that didn't seem to be a pattern. So the Beakersfield Memorial, which was unveiled in March 1920, that only lists the names of the nine men from the area who actually died, who did not return. And the rest of them have been honoured by a tree at the Beaconsfield of Honour, at the, at the Beaconsfield Avenue of Honour. So I can understand the criteria for that. They only selected the men who died, but um, I don't know, sometimes you can't understand it. The Narry Warren Memorial has 29 names, of which seven of the men had a Narry Warren connection because their fathers worked for the Victorian Railways and had been stationed at the Narry Warren Railway Station. So clearly um, they were probably only in the area for a short time, but they obviously made an impression on the area because their name is listed on the memorial. So. So we have the uh, physical honor, uh, memorials that you see in the main street or the high streets. And then, of course, there's honour boards. So, you know, we saw the one before the Yalek honour board and there was one at St. Patrick's School. But there were, every church, every organisation, as far as I can see, had an honour board. This one here is from the Bunyip Methodist Church, which is now at the uh, Uniting Church. It's interesting when you do research, of course, on these church um, memorials how you find out that some of the soldiers aren't listed as actually being Methodist and some are Presbyterian and some are Anglican, but um, clearly for some reason they had this connection to the, to the church and they were put on the honour board. And this one here, which is a beautiful one, this is the Cranbourne Presbyterian Church um, honour board, which was rescued a few years ago by a member of the Cranbourne Shire Historical Society because it was being thrown out by the church which is just astounds me that they could even do that. However, lucky for us, it was rescued and it's now at the Cranbourne Shire Historical Society. And that's just a beautiful board. So it's beautiful to look at, but it's beautiful to the fact that they're, you know, that they're honouring the soldiers, which is, which is the main point, of course, about these memorials. Um, if you uh, ever got to see um, Bernie Dingle's Light Horse Museum at Narnagoon, you'd know that he has a massive collection of honour boards, which, which was rescued by the RSL in the 1980s by all these uncaring corporations who were turfing them out. I mean, that was an absolute disgrace at the time, but we're very lucky that they were rescued by the RSL and that Bernie Dingle could house them in his museum or else they'd be gone. They'd just be gone to the scrap heap like this one would have been. Uh, this is a Yellick Roll of Honour. We saw the other one before. For some reason, Yellick had two rolls of honour. They had this one here, which was the one um, that was unveiled in 1918 before the war ended, which is now, as I said, the Lang Lang Historical, Lang Lang RSL, with photographs of all the soldiers. And this one here, which is at the 
um, which may have been in the hall, one may have been in the hall, one may have been in the school, but um, we have this one here at the um, Kirup Historical Society, but that's a lovely little one. And this one here, we've seen this one, is the Kirup um, on a board, which was at the Memorial Hall at Kirup, and we now have this one at the Historical Society as well. So it's interesting to see also the way they do the names, because this here, if you look at it, clearly the names aren't in alphabetical order, even though sometimes they are. And um, the fonts are a bit different, the size of the writings are a bit different, so they've clearly added on names as the war has progressed. So this one, as I said, was at the Memorial Hall when it was originally unveiled, and, uh, and, and the Memorial Hall was demolished. So this brings us now to looking at Memorial Halls of which a prime example is Kuru Up. This is the Kuru Up Memorial Hall in the 1934 flood. So as you can see from the hall, the original um, weatherboard bit at the back that was built in 1902. And in 1912, it became a Mechanics Institute. And this front part here, the brick part, was uh, built in 19, um, 23, 1923, 1922, as a Memorial Hall. So, um, and it became a memorial hall. It was demolished, the hall was demolished about, I don't know, 15 years ago. And this is another photo of it before it was demolished. So a memorial hall is a practical way for a community to have a, have a um, memorial to honour their soldiers, but also as a, as a practical uh, community space as well. Other local community memorial halls was this one at Lang Lang, which is a lovely looking hall, which was um, with the two the honours, the honour rolls at the front, which was which burnt down in I think the 1970s, replaced by the existing hall. And this one here, just further afield at Lang Gatha, that's still there. That's a great looking hall, the memorial hall at Lang Gatha. And this lovely little hall here at Caram Downs. So this Caram Downs Memorial Hall was opened in 1930. And this article here from the Dana Journal says, um, one has noticed a very presentable building being erected. So this presentable building, I love that term, was actually the Caram Downs Memorial Hall. So a beautiful little hall, just you know, built by the community to honour their local soldiers. It doesn't have to be grand, but it was just a lovely hall. And then of course, there's a Lindhurst Hall Memorial Hall which was erected in 1922 to honour these two men, um, Lieutenant Kirkham and Driver Payne. The hall burnt down in 1940 and a new, uh, in the 1940s sometime, I haven't got the exact date, and a new um, memorial was erected a few years ago, which I'll talk about later. The other thing, uh, another practical way to honour the soldiers was to create a hospital. So uh, Cure Up, once again, we'll go back to Cure Up, had a had a bush nursing hospital that was established in 1918 and in 1923 they decided to make to build a a soldiers memorial hospital and that was opened in 1923 very much a community effort i've seen other photos of the hall being built of all the locals and kids and everyone helping to build the hall and that's the, uh, the hall here that was opened the, the, sorry the hospital that was opened in 1923 and that's a, like just such a great practical thing um, but I couldn't find any other examples of World War I hospitals. There were, um, there was a um, soldiers memorial wing at the Echuga Hospital. There was a World War I memorial. And Rochester, Nearham South and Namurka have hospitals erected as a World War II memorials. And this one here, of course, at Lee Gatha, also a World War II memorial. And it's here, it was opened in 1958. Very plain looking building. Another thing, people, another thing communities love with memorial gates. So we looked at here, of course, at the memorial gates at um, Gateway at Narry Warren, which, as I said before, was the entrance to the Recreation Reserve. Still one of my favourite all-time memorials. And then also locally in the area is this lovely one here, the memorial entrance to, uh, the gates of the entrance to the Beaconsfield Park on the corner of the highway and the road that goes to Emerald. And this is a lovely little story. This was unveiled in 1939. Um, and it was paid for by the Mrs. Craven, who were for many years in charge of the Beaconsfield Post Office. So they, they funded this lovely um, entrance way to the Beaconsfield Park as a memorial. The sign you see here was uh, renovated or refurbished a few years ago, then it was stolen. 
and they've replaced it, but I believe the original sign has been found again. And also in this area, of course, is the uh, memorial dates at officer which were um, unveiled in Armistice Day 1951. And they have a memorial to both World War I and World War II soldiers. And once again, at the entrance to the Recreation Reserve, they've spent a lot of money to council the RSL on refurbishing the area. A few years ago, it was looking very, um, very down and people were putting signs on it and things like that. But now uh, they've spent you know, money, they've put lighting in and everything to just really um, show the respect to the gates that they deserve. And we weren't the only area where there's a memorial gates. This one here is at Matoa. I love this one, Unvalley 1921. But because I love grand things and grand architecture, these are some of my favourite gates. And these are the uh, memorial gates at um, Maddenley Park at Beckers Marsh. And they were presented to um, the people at Beckers Marsh as a memorial to the fallen soldiers of the district and Unvalley 1922. And these gates were originally the gates of Labassa, the big man, the mansion in um, Caulfield on the corner. Of, they originally were on the corner of Orang Road and Balaclava Road. And when Labassa, when the grounds of Labassa were being subdivided in the 1920s, the gates were removed and the people of Beckers Marsh took the gates and put it as a memorial, used them as memorial gates to their park. So that's a lovely way to repurpose old, old gates. And, you know, it's a lovely bit of history as well. And this one here, this is lovely. <laughs> These are the memorial gates at Warwickville. And there's a sign on it saying that they were erected by the women of the Shire of Barung in memory of the men who lost their lives. So that's that little plaque, one of these plaques here, this one here, I think. So it's just so lovely that the women of the area actually fundraised for the gates so they could put a memorial to their men who had gone away all and served, you know, served in the war. So they're lovely gates. I just love war memorials. I just, I don't, I don't love, um, I love them because I love the way the community honours the, the men who went away and it's not glorifying war at all. It's just trying to um, commemorate all the ones who made the sacrifices. Memorial schools. There's interesting, the, uh, this is the Dimboola Memorial High School. Um, once again, in Dimboola, there was a series of public meetings to decide what sort of form the war memorial should take and in the end they decide to um, have a memorial high elementary school and that is another really practical way to honor the soldiers so it's just I, I keep saying the words lovely but I just think that's such a beautiful gesture so this school was unveiled in July 1921 and sort of on the same theme but not quite the same is that Dandong High School which was uh, opened in 1919 the first headmaster was Percy Langford, and he had served in the fourth, fourth Light Horse, whose colours were two shades of blue and red. And that's why they chose the colours of the school to honour um, the headmaster, Mr Langford's war service. So that's a Dano High School logo. And that's just a lovely thing. The school motto is, whatever the school motto is, it means every man is the architect of his own destiny. Printed matter. So after the war, there was lots of um, lots of organisations bought out books of um, of their soldiers who served in the war. So this is the Education Department's book, which was published just after the war finished, and it lists um, it lists. Let me go back here. Sorry, it lists details the men who enlisted. The men who fell, inspectors, teachers, and other departmental officers whose sons or brothers died in service, the men who returned, honours and decorations, the men who volunteered and who were rejected, and the memorials. So as you can imagine, it is like a wonderful source of family history if any of your um, ancestors were um, in the education department. It just goes through lo lots of photos as well. They also produced the same thing after the Second World War. So, uh, and a lot of private schools, Melbourne Grammar produced their own book as well. Um, so there's lots of other, um, um, you know, those sort of booklets that you can find of war service after the war. Other printed matter includes these newspaper lists. This is from the South Berkeley Mornington Journal of May 31, 1917. But the, the, Danong, the, the South Berkeley 
and Mornington Journal produced this list on a regular basis and kept updating it, lists out the list of the men from the area who enlisted. And, and this happened all throughout Australia. You'd, you'd often find if you go to the local papers on Trove, which we can so easily access these days, lists and lists of men who have volunteered. And of course, sometimes the nurses as well. I should have said that, yeah. And this produced, this was produced by the uh, Berwick and Cranbourne Shires. I don't know where the original is, but the Berwick Pack and the Historical Society reproduced this a few years ago, and you can actually get a copy of it from them. And it lists 500, the names of 500 men, who, men and women, mainly men, of course, who, um, who enlisted in the war from the Shire, Berwick and Shire of Cranbourne. So it's just a really lovely, um, a lovely thought. So whether it came out with a newspaper or something, I don't really know the origin of it. So. Of course, um, many of the many of the um, uh, memorials that we've talked about just before have been have been community organ have been community memorials. So after the war, the community themselves decided to put the memorial up. But there were some government memorials, and of course, we know the Australian War Memorial in um, Canberra, which was opened in 1941. But of course, in Victoria, we have the shrine, which we'll just fast forward to what the shrine looks like, you all know that of course, which opened in, was opened by the um, Duke of Gloucester on November the 11th, 1934. Uh, the shrine, shrine is built of granite, quarried at Tainong, so very local. This was a uh, shot from the newspaper about granite for an everlasting shrine. The um, The caption that went with this newspaper article said, they're certain that the people of the state will fully approve the National War Memorial Committee has fully will have fully approved that the National War Committee has now decided that the Shrine of Remembrance shall be built not of freestone, which is subject to weathering, but of granite, the most lasting of structural materials. Beautiful silver grey granite of an eminently suitable kind is available at Tainong in Gippsland. A workman is shown here in this photo, hewing the blocks of granite from the hillside. So they measure up to six cubic feet. They're huge. There's other photo here. Surprisingly, I can't find many photographs of the time on quarry, but there's another one here from Museums Victoria of some of the um, granite from the quarry. And they've produced this beautiful one. They also um, had an extension a few years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, which also built out of the time on, time on granite. other memorials. So there's a whole range of other memorials and a soldier settlement is not quite a memorial, but it's an interesting um, concept that after the war, First World War and Second World War, the soldiers who had enlisted could apply for a land under a soldier settlement scheme. And all up, it says something like 11,000 um, people applied, not all of them were successful. And of course, once they had the land, not all the farmers were successful, but it was sort of a way to honour the soldiers in their service. And the uh, Public Records Office of Victoria, quite a few years ago, have um, digitised all the records of the soldiers. So that's just been a great, it's a great website. And so you'll see the whole application of the, the application of the soldiers, which often tells you their um, war experience and their farming experience, how much money they had, whether they were married, yeah, lots and lots of information from it. And um, it's just so interesting to see to see the files. Um, so that's the Soldier Settlement Battle to Farm website. And of course, uh, in Soldier Settlement areas, you'd often find, you get a hint to where the Soldier Settlement areas were by the name of the roads. So we have a Soldier's Road in Rithdale, a Soldier's Road in Beaconsfield, and a Soldier's Road in Caldermead. And they were all because the uh, areas were originally Soldier Settlers, uh, Soldier Settler um, areas developments. And another sort of settlement area in the area was um, the one at Narrowarren North of Fox Road where there were seven, seven families all honoured. And this uh, lovely bit of granite was opened in um, March 2017. And there's a plaque on it. It's a beautiful little, little park and it's a great way. This is just a lovely recent memorial to honour soldiers. Other sorts of memorials. I came across this one here, um, All Souls Memorial Church in, um, oops, sorry, in um, Sandringham. 
and this is in Bay Road, Sandringham, and it was said to be uh, the first war memorial church in Melbourne. It is a handsome and distinctive edifice built entirely of reinforced concrete. Its sombre grey tower seems a fitting embodiment of the spirit of sacrifice and forms a striking landmark. landmark. So that's an interesting church. And it was also interesting for the fact that it was the first church in Melbourne to be built of concrete. So it has another engineering aspect as well. So that's still there if you want to see that. Old Souls Church in Sandringham. And the second memorial church, uh, a World War I memorial church in Melbourne, was the Peace Memorial Methodist Church whose um, uh, foundation stone was laid in November 1921. It's now the St. Catherine's Greek Orthodox Church. But the church is still there, which is really nice. But that, once again, is another memorial church. Uh, many churches, of course, have memorial windows that families put in after the war to honour their dead sons or dead fathers who died in the war. But this lovely memorial window is in um, the Tribe Boys Home at Weather Farm at Wedderburn. Whether it's still there or not, I don't know, but I found this photo. It's just such a wonderful photo. And it was a memor window, memorial window to um, Lieutenant Joseph John Ruddock, who died of wounds in June 1918. It's just beautiful. And this is an interesting memorial. So this is a bridge that crosses um, Danny Nong Creek as you enter Danny Nong from the Hallam side, from this side here. And it, it's a peace memorial bridge. And it was opened in 19, August, 19, August 29, 1919, officially opened by the wife of the Danny Nong Shire president, Mrs. Abbott. She cut the ribbon. So there's a tablet on it that reads, in honour of the brave men who gave their lives to save civilization and to commemorate the Declaration of Peace, June 1919. It's just, it's just lovely. It's just a, just a wonderful practical idea to honour our soldiers having a bridge. And the bridge is still there. Uh, the plaque is still there. It's just beautiful. And there's two other bridges, according to the Victorian Heritage Database, two other peace bridges in uh, Victoria. One's at Mordialic, and this one here is at Omeo. I don't have any other details for that one. Other sorts of memorials include um, this uh, rotunda, a Fitzroy Peace Rotunda, which was opened in 1925 in a garden at Fitzroy. And this one here, this is lovely. This is a Fernie Hurst Memorial Shelter, which was erected on the former school site. So it was a school shelter shed for the children. And um, erected in um, 19, oh, just after the war, I haven't got a date here, sorry. Uh, and that's the plaque. It's just, it's just a wonderful thought that, you know, the, 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 um, especially as it was uh, on the school site, so many of the school children there, they would have had brothers or cousins who, who served in the war. And to see, you know, their people's names on their on their school shoulder shed, I, I just think that's a wonderful, um, a wonderful memorial. So that's a little one there, Fernie Hurst. Yeah, I get very sentimental with these things. I just love them. Um, now, a very interesting memorial, two two interesting memorials, which uh, I'll tell you how I got to there. This is a photograph of my husband took of his truck he was driving in 1969 at Tubbs Hill near on the Hume Highway near Long near uh, Euroa. And I thought, hmm, what is Tubbs Hill? And it turns out that Tubbs Hill and Magars Hill were named after two World War I soldiers, BC winners who came from Euroa. So Frederick Harold Tubb, Harold Tubb and Leslie Cecil Magar. And they both won, uh, both were awarded BCs during the war. And in 1934, the Euroa, um, Council decided that they would uh, apply to the Country Roads Board for permission to name two hills along the Hume Highway near Longwood, Mega and Tub Hill, Tubbs Hill. And they were named after these two uh, BC winners. So that's a lovely way to honour soldiers, having a hill named after you. It also says that they were going to um, name a um, another hill after another winner. Um, how do I get rid of that? So I've got a little thing in front of me. I can't actually see the, um, I know after another win that Mr. Burton, but I don't know if that was actually ever done. However, we have two hills out of Eurora named after VC winners. 
This is the uh, Shire of Eltham Memorial at Kangaroo Ground that's still there now. I think they've got a, um, a communications tower at the top of it, which looks quite ugly, but that was there, the Shire of Eltham's memorial to their soldiers. Um, this tower here, which is probably like a fire tower, be great views of the surrounding area. And another lovely memorial is the uh, Mount Macedon Cross, unveiled in 1935. Um, it was actually replaced in 1995. It had been damaged by storms and fire. But that's a lovely one. Lovely one. I know I keep saying that. But it's a lovely memorial. However, if we didn't always treat our memorials with the respect that we treat them with today. So in um, I found came across this article in um, the Danong Journal in 1941, where they were complaining about how the um, Packer War Memorial, which had been erected only 20 years before in 1920 or 21, was actually now the scene of beer parties and it was neglected and forgotten. It was erected in um, Burke Park, which is opposite the railway station. And um, it just seems that apparently the secretary of the Shire, Berwick secretary, said at the meeting that it's used for drinking parties and couples returning from dances also use it as a parking space. And Councillor Burke said there are generally nine, eight or nine dozen beer bottles strewn around it. So what had happened was, of course, was the War Memorial was established. There were trustees, but as Councillor Burke said, the trouble was that nobody was responsible for the care of the memorial. He understood that all the trustees were dead. And because it was on railway land opposite the railway station, it wasn't actually even on council land either. So there was all these issues about who actually owned the memorial, who was responsible for the memorial. And so it ended up being neglected. Only, as I said, 20 years after it was first erected. Um, in the end, they've moved the uh, memorial now from Burke Park to near the um, Pakenham Hall. So now, of course, we do treat our memorials with more respect than what we treated them in 1941. And of course, um, what, what I said before about the um, 1980s, when all these big corporations are thrown out the wall, their um, memorial boards, apparently some of them want them back there from Bernie Dingle's museum. Well, they don't deserve them in my mind. Now, more recently, when we've been celebrating things like the um, 75th anniversary of Gallipoli in 1990, and then we had the 90th anniversary in 2005, and of course the 100th anniversary of the uh, of the war from 2014 to 2018, we began to look at uh, look at war memorials in a different light, and we've also established new memorials. So there's been a lot of government funding to establish memorials, and so for instance, this is the one at Curie Up which was a new cenotaph that which was unveiled in 2017 outside the um, community centre. And also in 2015, they planted a, a new avenue of honour. And this is just typical of many other towns and other areas that new memorials have been uh, established in the last, say, 20 years. Another one, of course, is here at Emerald, where the Emerald Walk was unveiled in 2015. So, this walk honours the soldiers who lost their lives. And these soldiers had originally been honoured in the Avenue of Honour in Emerald, which was cut down for road widening in the 1950s. So they then re-established this in 2015. And that's just a lovely, a lovely um, memorial as well. And we get new memorials and different sorts of memorials. So this is this uh, wonderful statue by Peter Corlett of um, the grieving mother. And this is to represent all women in Victoria and Australia who lost one of the, who lost a son or lost a brother in, in, um, in the war. And that's just, it's just a, a really poignant memorial. So, and that's of course, as you can see in front of the um, Arch of Honour, at uh, Archway of Honour at um, Ballarat. Uh, this is another new memorial, which was unveiled in 2017. So this is at Lindhurst. And this memorial, this, the, the writing on it says, this door represents the homestead door for eight young men, farmers and rural workers who left their home in the Lindhurst district to fight in World War I and World War II. Sadly, they never returned to comfort of home, family and friends that awaited them. So it symbolises who they were fighting for, home, family, country and freedom. So as I said, this memorial was unveiled in uh, 2017 and there lists two World War I soldiers and eight World War II soldiers. And... Um, what I have a problem, the problem I have with this is, of course, is that if you were a member, if you lived in Lindhurst and a relatively new um, 
present in the community, you would think that only two soldiers enlisted from Lindhurst in World War I, when in fact I've counted at least 21 soldiers who enlisted, and yet they only mention two names. I really feel this is a bit of a lost opportunity, that they spent so much money on this memorial and only immortalised two names when they could have immortalised at least 20 others. And what really um, irks me is the fact that they did not include Walter Norkay, who was killed in action in October 1917, who was actually born in Lindhurst on the very property where this memorial is. And the fact that he wasn't included is just a, a travesty, I think. So I think this shows you the problem of trying to create a memorial 100 years down the track, which gets me on to my last bit of a rant, if you like, about... I think it's too, I think, I, I think a memorial like this one here, which represents all mothers or might it represent all soldiers is a really lovely thing. And that's what we should be doing now. But to have a memorial that cherry picks two names from a hundred years ago is wrong because we're missing out on so many other people's names. And we can't tell now what was in the minds of the community at the time. And, and who they would have honoured. We've only got to look at the ones at Nary Warren, where so many of the names are people are from um, people from railway families who weren't long-term residents of the area. And yet at the time, they were considered to be um, contributing members of the, of the community and whose name was worthy enough to be in a war memorial. What they would miss out if we were doing this 100 years later. So my another example of another man who would miss out is Charlie Burns. So Charlie Burns is on the Nary Warren War Memorial and there's various reports in local papers about him enlisting here, as you can see, and there's a lovely report about him at an annual cricket club concert where he was to the fore with his humorous songs, clog dances and spoon items. He was obviously a man of, you know, a great musical talent. So he, and this report here that says he enlisted in February 1916. So I've tried to identify who Charlie Burns from Nary Warren, who is on the Nary Warren Memorial is, but I cannot do that. There's five Charlie Burns who enlisted from Victoria. None were born in Nary Warren. None had a Nary Warren address. And, and none had any, of, and there's no way I can find, I specifically identify this Charlie Burns. And I just think it's a hundred years, so a hundred years down the track, if we were doing a memorial for Nary Warren, it's unlikely because we cannot find his connection to the town, that he would be on a war memorial that we established now. And yet at the time, he was considered to be, you know, a man who, who should be on their memorial. So I feel that, you know, trying to recreate a memorial 100 years down the track or whatever is, is the wrong thing to do. That's my personal belief. So this is the end of my talk there. And... Um, really just my tribute to all the men and women who served in the war and um, risked their lives for, for Australia. So thank you.